morning and welcome to the Charlestown Presbyterian Church virtual worship service for this Sunday, July 26, 2020. We are so glad you could be with us this morning. We are here to worship our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we prepare to do that, I do want to highlight some announcements. Actually, just one. If you read through our church's newsletter, you can see that we will be continuing with virtual worship for the foreseeable future. That decision is explained in the newsletter. We have the safety of our church family and our community uh, as the highest priority in that decision. And you can read more about that in our church newsletter. We are here today to worship our Lord. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for gathering us here today. We ask, Lord, that you would prepare our hearts for worship. Help us, O oh Lord, to focus on you, to listen to you, to hear you, to be open to the moving and working of your Spirit. Help us, Lord, to glorify you in this hour of worship. We commit this time to you in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Our first song this morning is Gather Us In. The words are printed in the order of worship where you will also find the music. expectations, 
and reorder our priorities until they reflect your vision of well-being for all. Your kingdom surprises us with grace upon grace, but we cling to the values of this world, which privilege products over people, success over service, and competition for resources over the common good. Open us to new ways of living that embody your desire for creation and contribute to a commonwealth marked by justice and joy. Amen. Friends, we read in the book of Romans in chapter 5, verse 8, that Paul says that God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We do want to take our joys and concerns to the Lord. I have a uh, unique joy this morning. Obviously, something has happened to me, if you are surprised to see this. Uh, I had an accident on my bike on Thursday. It was just me in the road, a fluke thing. Uh, but the joy is that I'm here. It could have been a lot worse. Tuesday, I find out for sure if I have broken my wrist. Uh, but we appreciate your prayers for that. But I am grateful to be upright and speaking in whole sentences. Praise God for the technology of bike helmets and that it wasn't worse than it was. We also want to be praying for the family of Helen Foltz. Helen went to be with the Lord on Thursday. Services for her are graveside this coming Thursday at 11 a.m. over at Edge Hill Cemetery. If you do plan to attend that, please observe social distancing and wear a mask. We are also uh, dealing with uh, decisions concerning our children in school. There is a lot of anxiety in the world about that right now. And we need to make that a matter of prayer. So we want to pray for parents, for teachers, administrators, and all those who make those decisions. And of course, we want to continue to pray for those who are sick, those who have experienced loss during this time of pandemic. Let us go to God for prayer. Gracious and loving God, we are so grateful to come into your presence this day. We do ask for your blessing on those who are experiencing difficult times at the moment, Lord, for those who are dealing with loss, loss of loved ones, loss of jobs, Lord, be with them in that time. Minister to them, grant them your peace, cause them to trust you in this moment. We do pray especially, Lord, for the family of Helen Foltz. We ask for their be comfort and grace for them as they continue to celebrate her life and remember her. Grant them your peace. Lord, be with those who are making decisions for our children regarding schooling. We pray, Lord, most importantly, for their protection, for the protection of our children, teachers and educational staff and we pray lord that you would guide those who are responsible for making decisions that they would do what is best for our children that they would be able to both learn and be safe during this time and lord all of this makes us anxious makes us nervous makes us worried Help us, Lord, to always remember that you are in charge. This is still your world. Help us to turn to you, to trust you, and look to you at this time especially. All of these things we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Before we ask for God's blessing as we read His Word this morning, I do want to let you know that we are starting a new series. We are going to be going through the book of Matthew, but we're not starting at the very beginning because we know the very beginning because almost every Christmas we read several passages throughout the season from the first few chapters of Matthew. And we're not going to do the Beatitudes because I recently preached through those in the last couple of years. So we're going to start in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. Before we get there, though, let us have a word of prayer. Gracious God, we are so grateful for your word. We are so grateful that it contains such a rich history of how your plan of salvation was formed and made and communicated to your people. For the way your living and active word still speaks to us this day. We ask, Lord, that your spirit would illuminate our hearts this day. That we would hear your word. That we would listen to your voice. And we would live for you. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Our passage today is Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount. He is finished with the Beatitudes, and this is what he says next. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand that gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. When I married my wife seven years ago, we had one of those typical discussions you have when you get married about who is going to do what in the house. And my wife was absolutely clear about something. She said to me, You get to clean the fridge. I get that. You know, you open the fridge some days and you are greeted with a smell. And you just don't know where that's coming from sometimes. That's frustrating. You want to clean up the source of that smell. But you also don't want to smell it. So you want to keep that fridge door shut. And we've all been guilty of smelling it, shutting it, and walking away. Not my problem. But the worst is when you're cleaning the fridge and you find a container and you have no idea how long it's been in the fridge. And so you stand there looking at the container, trying to remember what meal it was you had that you had leftovers and you stored in this particular container. You give it a shake. Sounds like a vegetable. Maybe it's meat. Is it a cake? I don't know. You hold it up to the light. I don't know if anyone's done that trick to see if there's, you know, anything growing on the sides. Maybe you'll get a little illumination here somehow. You do everything you can to avoid option last, which is opening the container. Because if it's been in there and you can't remember how long it's been in there, it is probably going to smell bad. So you have two options. 
you can either throw it out or you can open it up. Nine times out of ten, whoo, does that smell bad? And then, and I know it's the men, we've all done this. Honey, come smell this! <laughs> <laughs> when something stinks, we want to avoid the smell. We want to avoid the source of the smell. When Jesus comes on the scene in 30 AD, the people of Israel were downwind of some serious stink. The Roman Empire had allowed them certain liberties, but the people of Israel were in constant conflict with the Roman government. They didn't recognize Caesar as divine. There was only one God, and Caesar wasn't him. The Roman Empire had leveled unbelievable taxes amongst the Jewish people. They had no choice but to pay them. Because the Jewish people had been living under foreign rule for over 500 years, there were constant uprisings. And so the Jewish people often found themselves at odds with the Roman authorities. They lived in a kind of constant anxiety, and they hated it. But there was also a stench coming from Jerusalem. After the exile, the Jewish people came back to their country, living under foreign rule still, and the ensuing years led to the rise of different factions in the religious leadership of the nation. Now, Israel was a theocracy, and that meant that their religious life was absolutely tied to their political and national life. So if you had the religious power over the people, you also had political power. These factions, in order to keep that power, would offer different interpretations of the law, and that affected how things were celebrated and understood and taught. And there would be different interpretations. And the largest of these groups that was doing this was the Pharisees. There was nothing more important to the Pharisees than fidelity to the law. In order to stay pure, they added a bunch of extra laws that they felt were just as important as the scriptures themselves. For them, outward appearance was more important than inner reality. And so that meant you could hate your brother or sister or your parents, but as long as you followed all the rules to a T, no one questioned your faith. On the other hand, you might have a deep passion for God, but be struggling with a particular area of sin. For that person, there was no grace, no mercy, no love. It was into this muck, mire, and stench that Jesus begins his ministry. And he comes with a very simple message. Followers of God must live out their faith deliberately and purposely. Anything else stinks. Now there is, if you will, a stench in our time. Our world has been fractured recently by serious issues that have made their way into our churches. Politics, race, and the pandemic have divided the people of this country, and many of these issues have found their way into the families of faith. For example, we took something as simple as wearing a mask, which is a great and easy way to love your neighbor, and we made it some kind of symbol about our political and national liberty. We made it bigger than the mask itself. And that's not the only place where that's happened. We mistrust our government and our media so much that every time a news story comes out, we dig deeper for the real meaning. But when we start mistrusting everything, we have a hard time trusting anything or anyone. 
That spells trouble for the life together that we are supposed to have in our churches. Because if we can't trust each other, we can't engage in ministry together. Now, there are a lot of ways that we are not like the Pharisees, but there are some ways that we are. Now, unlike the Pharisees, we kind of, as Americans, hate the ideas, the idea of rules and laws. We don't want anybody adding to the law in order to compromise our freedom. We're Americans. We're free. Great. But we are in a very self-serving moment of our history. And we hate the idea of changing what we do for anyone or anything else. Now imagine what that means when it comes to issues of faith. Because we ought to be willing to change for God. To have God change us. But we want to do what we want to do. Unlike the Pharisees, though, we don't add to the law, mostly because we don't really know the law like we used to. And ideas of obedience and devotion to God, they receive a courteous nod. But that's about it. Right now, we live in a time that's being called a cancel culture. And what that means is that anything a person has ever said or done in his or her lifetime can be used to get them fired or muzzled, canceled. There's no grace, no room for a person to change their viewpoints, no room for mistakes. We cancel and then we look for the next offender. And that mindset is present even in the body of Christ. Like the world, we lack mercy, forgiveness, and love. And isn't that the essence of the gospel? When we behave that way, we lose our saltiness. We shudder our light. We are not a city on a hill. Are people turning away from the message of hope and love of the gospel when they look at the church because they see no discernible difference between the Christians and the world? Have we stopped living deliberately and purposely for Jesus? Do we stink? In our passage, Jesus uses three metaphors to make his point. Salt, light, and a city on a hill. Salt was used as both a spice and a preservative in the first century. It was used to add flavor and to keep food from spoiling. And that's really still how we use salt today. The difference today, though, is that we put additives in our table salt, and what that does is it means that our table salt will only last about five years. In the first century, however, they use natural salt, and natural salt does not go bad. So believe it or not, when Jesus says, what do you do when your salt spoils? He's actually being funny here. He's using irony. When he says, what do you do when salt loses its saltiness? His hearers would have snickered and giggled. What a preposterous idea that is. But Jesus is making an extreme metaphor. If your salt spoils, throw it out. Jesus is encouraging something specific in this metaphor. Because he says, don't be like salt. He says, be salt. You are the salt. He is saying that followers of God should bring a better flavor to the world. A way of life, if you will, that preserves godliness, a relationship between God and his people. Jesus is speaking in a sense of restoration and preservation. He also talks about light. You are the light of the world. Again, Jesus is using humor here. No one lit a lamp and then covered it up in the first century because 
Lamps were not like light bulbs then. You didn't flick a switch, there were no battery, there was no electricity, there was no power. You had to take light from the fire and either light a candle or a kerosene lamp. So it would be kind of silly to take that lamp and then cover it up with that candle and snuff it out. That would be redundant, purposeless. Again, humor from Jesus. But light was used to illuminate the whole house so you could see what you were doing, so you wouldn't trip in the middle of the house on the chair that somebody left sticking out, or the book that was on the floor, or a rock that was sticking up out of the ground. What that light does is bring safety, security, and maybe even direction if you are carrying it with you. Jesus is telling his disciples to let your faith be seen by others so that other people will see and believe. And then we get to the city on the hill. Jesus gives us just one sentence. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Now in the first century, a city on a hill could mean several things. For the weary traveler, spotting that city on the hill and rest. For the person who is seeking a new way of life, it meant hope. Even back then, people moved from the village to the city. There were more jobs, more resources, more people, more connections. For the one coming to the city, it meant destination. Followers of Christ find all of this in Him. A lost world needs restoration. A desperate world needs hope. A dark world needs light. A weary world needs rest. And there is only one place people will find it. The people of God are given the greatest, the most tremendous privilege to be the way, the people, the vessel through which God shares his gospel. The church of Jesus Christ ought to be the vessel through which the world finds restoration and hope and light and rest. Jesus comes into a world filled with darkness, duplicity, and despair. He offers light, truth, and love. And he encourages all of us to live out our faith deliberately. Based on our passage, and this should not be a surprise because there are three metaphors in the passage, I want to suggest three ways we can deliberately live out our faith. First, stay salty. You know, I don't mean salty the way the kids mean. Some of you don't know what I mean, let me explain that. The kids have an expression, although I, I haven't heard it in a while, but every once in a while you'll hear one of them say, why are you being so salty? And what they mean by that is, who made you angry? Why are you so grouchy? Who made you mad? That's not what Jesus means. Jesus means that we ought to bring flavor to the world, a godly flavor. We also ought to be preserving godliness. That's on us. How do we do that? Through regular prayer and personal Bible study as a start. Imagine if you never filled your car with fuel. You only go so far before running out. Prayer and Bible study are used by God to shape us into the people he wants us to be. They are fuel for the journey of faith. If you want to be salty for Jesus, make prayer and scripture a priority. Start with just a few minutes each day if this is not a habit for you. Get a journal or a piece of paper. Jot down the people most important in your life and pray for them. But here's what's interesting. God will answer those prayers that you offer but God is also going to change you in the process. It's amazing. And then, of course, the scriptures, they speak to us. They show us the very revelation of God. And even if you only take five or ten minutes a day to read the Word, 
that will shape and change your life. And notice this. God doesn't tell us to go make the world salty. Jesus tells us in this passage, be salt. Because the only people that we can make salty is ourselves, individually. And that's through Christ and God helping us. Prayer, scripture, all of those things. That's how we are made salty. So don't go and try to make other people salty. Don't go and try and change the world. Let Christ change you. And that is how the world will change. Second, shine your light. This one's a little tougher because we live in a world that is at times downright hostile towards the gospel. And it has always been that way. In Acts chapter 3, as the early church was just learning how to be the church, Peter and John are on their way to the temple one morning, and they see a man who is crippled from birth, he's lame, and God uses that moment through Peter to heal that man. Of course, this leads to a crowd forming at the temple. Peter preaches the gospel, and that leads to Peter and John being thrown in prison for the night. Now listen to these verses as the story continues in Acts chapter 4. They arrested them, Peter and John, and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. Amazing. In chapter 3, we read that on Pentecost, there are about 3,000 people who came to faith. Now it's almost double that. Why? Because Peter and John shined their light. Now we don't have to get arrested. We might. We don't have to always preach. It could just be a conversation, an act of love. But we have to shine our light. We don't know what's going to happen when we do that. But serving Jesus can be scary business. But it's also very surprising. Because the next day, Peter and John have a hearing. Now, you might think that the, the threat of further jail time might make Peter tone it down. If you read about this in Acts chapter 4, Peter doubles down. He preaches the gospel again. And you know what happens? They let him go. They have no reason to hold them. They let him go. Surprise. So be light. Finally, be a city on a hill. This one is directed to all of us in the church because it is a corporate effort. It is not merely individual. It is not on one person or a couple of people because every particular church, every gathered group of people before the Lord is called to make disciples. To do that in this dark and troubling world, we need to be people who shine the light of Christ far and wide. And the only way we can do it far and wide is to do it together. We need to be a place of hope and love. We need to be a hospital for the hurting, not a sanctuary for the sanctimonious. That means we welcome people, we lead them to Jesus, we journey with them as they work out their faith in Christ. It is messy, challenging work, but it is also life-giving, life-saving work that glorifies God. Jesus came to a people who were lost, aimless, and trying to navigate life in a dark and difficult time. It would have been so easy for Jesus to have just blended into the Roman Empire or to jump into one of the Jewish sects. Jesus chose to do neither. And he calls us to do neither. He calls his people to live out their faith in a very deliberate manner. Jesus wants his people to bring a godly flavor to the world, to preserve godliness and not hide it. He wants his people to shine his light and share his love. He wants his people 
to live hopefully, gracefully, and mercifully as they share that hope, grace, and mercy with all. When we live out our faith deliberately, we glorify God in Christ. Let us pray. Gracious God, we read some challenging words in these few verses. It is hard to always be salt and light. In this world, it offers so many other options, so many other temptations, so many other possibilities. Lord, it is easy to follow others. Help us to follow you. Help us to be salt, to be light, to be a city on a hill, that we would shine your light, your love, your gospel for all to see and hear and know. We ask this, Lord, in your holy name. Our final song for the morning is As a Fire is Meant for Burning. Let us sing together.